Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Hey guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. This week, I'm very excited and honored to welcome a guest who, from a distance, I've been admiring their work for a long time. I will have to say, I may be geeking out a little bit here because this is a bucket list interview for me to be able to have this guest on the podcast because of everything that they've been presenting. I'm a huge fan. So without further ado, I just want to go ahead and get it out there. This week, our guest on the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast is Mr. Kyle Mann. Kyle, thank you so much for joining the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. This will be a lot of fun. Yeah, and for those that may not fully understand who Kyle is, I'll let him kind of get into that. But for those of us that do, you know, this is huge moment here uh, for me to be able to do this. So thank you so much for joining. But for those that may be wondering, Kyle, man, I know the name. Maybe I don't know the name. Give me a little bit of a backdrop of who Kyle is. Sure. Uh, so I'm the editor in chief of the Babylon Bee. Um, so my job is to, uh, both write and Photoshop and edit and, uh, whatever needs to be done to get out our, uh, crazy schedule of articles each day. So Babylon B is a you know, Christian news satire website. So we, uh, we publish articles on everyday life, on church life, Christian stuff, theology, uh, politics, current events, whatever's going on. We'll try to find a fun satirical angle on it and throw it out there. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I, I got involved with the website, um, right when it launched the day it launched March 1st, 2016. And, uh, and I've been working there ever since. So about six years now, um, I was part-time at first. And then a few years ago, I made a, a big career leap and I switched from a crazy, uh, sales job to, uh, to be a, <laughs> to be a humor writer on the internet. So, uh, that's not a career move that most people make, but uh, but it ended up working out, and it's just it's a total blast every day to uh, to be able to write jokes and and see all the reactions and uh, and yeah, that's what I do day in and day out. So uh, so that's who I guess that's who I am, or th- or that's what I do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, again, I am a huge fan. I I live this this type of life. Uh, you know, I'm in ministry full time. I'm an itinerant minister. I teach at a school of revival here at our home church. I travel the nation and the nations of the earth. And I, laughter is a big thing for me. You know, I'm one of these that say life's too short not to laugh at the expense of others. And if you can't find someone to laugh at, uh, there's a couple of options. Go to Walmart after midnight. It won't take long or look in the mirror, you are that individual for someone else. And I believe so much of the church as a whole, Christianity, really does need to learn how to laugh at times. And so before we get into your new book and stuff, I do have to ask the question, you know, what is that perception like for you to be able to kind of at times poke fun uh, and laugh at the expense of Christianity, aside from politics and, you know, Hollywood actors and everything, but the church as a whole, what is that like for you to be able to share that information and getting people in and teaching people it's okay to laugh at times? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, humor is such a humor is such a broad topic and it's so um, misunderstood at times, I think by the church, especially Um, people think, you know, people think humor is, is for outside the church or, uh, Sec, your secularists or leftists have the uh, monopoly on humor and that con- Christians aren't allowed to laugh. Um, and, and that's, a, you know, that's obviously a misperception. I think any any cursory study of the Bible shows that God used humor, God used irony. Um, the prophets used humor and irony and mockery to call for change, um, to make a point. Um, and I think and I think God also, you know, I think God also created humor um, just just as a good in itself, you know, um, and I'm going to go on a little bit of a rabbit trail, but um, Christian art 
tends to suffer a lot because when, when, when we're writing Christian novels or Christian comics or Christian jokes, you know, we tend to see it as a teaching tool to get people saved or to, te- you know, teach the gospel. And, and, and I think humor can be used for that. I think art can be used for that, but we don't, we don't often see art as um, a good in itself. We don't often see art as having eternal value just as an end. Like, you know, I, 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 as a Christian, it's like I can make a good movie and that can glorify God just because I made a good movie, you know, that, that is honoring the Lord that w- with my skills and creativity and, and all this. And it's the same thing with a piece of art or a, a joke or a song. Um, you know, we, we tend to try to baptize things into Christian culture where, um, where, where really God, you know, God, is, if you are living a life that's aligned with God's word, if you are living a life that that's honoring to him, then what you do creatively is going to glorify God, um, you know. And uh, so, so I think I, I think we've misunderstood humor in a lot of ways in the church. Now, all of that to say making fun of the church we do because we love the church and it's not, you know, I, I think you use the phrase like at the expense of the church. I, I, I think it's, you know, it's more like, it's like at the expense of, it's, it's at the expense of the kind of modern traditions that we've built up around the gospel or the, you know, Christian culture is kind of more the target than, than the gospel or Christians or the church. Cause we love all those things. Um, yeah. If you've ever watched, a Hollywood movie that makes fun of Christians or it's set in a church or something, you know, it, it's such a different tone than what we do at the Babylon Bee because they don't understand the church. They don't, you watch a Hollywood show and they, and they write a Christian character and you're like, Oh, whoever wrote this has obviously never met a Christian in their life. Cause we're not like that at all. <laughs> you know, when the Babylon Bee writes a Christian joke, the hope is that people read it and go, Oh, these guys get it. They've, you know, obviously this is written by someone who's in the know who's it's inside baseball stuff for us. But yeah, I think, you know, I think there's different, there's different types of articles or different tones we can use. We can go after somebody hard or we can be more, um, more loving or just trying to make light of something to yeah. joke around to, to create a bit, a little bit of lightness. But yeah, that's our day in and day out here at the Bethlehem. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, I find it kind of in the category of, you know, an impression of someone is the highest form of flattery, they say. And for me, satire kind of pulls the, the for lack of a better word, a, a, a curtain back to kind of be able to laugh at our own messes sometime, the, own th- the things that we do. And I love how you worded that, the culture and, you know, the church culture per se, how we can be sometimes uh, concerning how seriousness we take ourselves and, and, and such. But I wonder because a lot of times I read uh, the titles and the articles and I kind of laugh and there's a side of me that goes, I actually kind of thought that to a degree, maybe not verbatim word by word, but that thought was already in my mind. Do you find that satire, uh, especially whether it's Christian or political, governmental, or whatever aspect it is, that it hits people more on a personal level and that's what is drawing them more and more to it? Yeah. I mean, there's an element, there's an element of satire where um, (laughs) I I think when Stephen King talks about writing books, he says that um, for his ideas, it's like, sometimes it's, you know, yeah, like lightning struck him and, (laughs) and he came up with a crazy idea and he has no idea where it came from and it's created out of thin air. And then other times, uh, Stephen King says he feels like, you know, he just unearthed something that was already there and he just had oh, his whole job is to just dig it out and keep brushing dust off things and uh, and getting it uh, and just getting it uncovered. And it could have been anyone that discovered it. It just happened to be him. And I think th- there's an element of a good joke or there's element of like a Babylon B headline where it's, you know, I don't know. We can't feel super proud about it because it's not it's not like something that I'm the first one to think this or make this observation, but it's, it's the way that we were able to frame it, the way that we put it out, the timing, um, the execution of the joke is just something that makes everybody relate to it and go, Oh man, I've been saying this for years, or I've all, I've believed this all along, or I wish I had thought of this. You know, those are, (laughs) those are the kind of reactions when you know that you really hit the nail on the head um, with satire. And that was the great, you know, that was the crazy thing starting up the Babylon Bee is that we didn't, we didn't write jokes 
with the intention of like, you know, it wasn't this manufactured thing where we go, you know, we, we analyzed the market and the demographics and said, you know, if we write a joke about church fog machines, you know, we're going to go viral and let's create this viral moment. On, you know, it's like we were just writing things that that we felt to be true. Like we just re- wrote things that were our experiences growing up in the church or whatever. And through that, um, you know, we found like you know, thousands of people across the country that are like, oh, my gosh, me too. This happened to me or this is exactly my church. You know, and it, it wasn't market research or, or, or fake or, or any kind of manufactured viral moment. It was like it was just like so many people in the church had been thinking all these things for years, but nobody had, nobody had put it together in this like, you know, thing that everybody could rally around. So the Babylon Beast kind of this entity that. I, I don't know. Pe- people feel like, where have you been all my life? And we tell people it's only six years old and they're like, what? I you know, feel like it's been around for decades because it's just become this institution that everybody just rallies around. And I think there's a lot of truth in that because it does feel like you guys have been doing this way longer than what you have because it is giving you the opportunity to expand the horizon, you know, from everything from politics to politicians uh, to states to whatever the case may be, you guys have a wide spectrum of things that you're covering and how you're looking at it and how you're presenting it throughout um, everyone that is a follower. But that also comes with a cost as well. You know, sometimes in church culture, we talk about how mean-spirited some Christians can be towards other Christians and that's all out in the world, but we are in a time right now where there's shadow banning happening, and, and there's things that have impacted uh, many people that use social media as an outlet to get their message out, their word out, whatever the case is. And you guys have embraced that and gone through that in in that. So I, I do want to know what has that journey been like for y'all as you've had to weed through the process because. Uh, long before the Elon Musk of, of the potential Twitter takeover and stuff, th- there was a lot of this having to recognize. And, and you've acknowledged it. I've seen it on your, your Twitter and, and stuff where uh, maybe an Instagram post or YouTube, uh, whatever, where y'all were getting so many likes and shares, it would dwindle down to nothing at times. What is that process like for y'all? Well, that's been a constant struggle for us, um, you know, since day one of the site, really. We started getting fact checked um, the first year that the Babylon Bee was in existence, um, and and it was. I, I think we did a joke saying that Elevation Church introduced a water slide baptismal, and uh, and it got it got fact checked by Snopes, um, and and you know it was kind of funny. You know, Pastor Stephen Furtick was on uh, was on his I don't know his Snapchat or his. Instagram or something, you know, saying, Hey guys, like that was fake, you know, don't believe that. And then there was a, <laughs> and then the Elevation Church posts on their Facebook page, like, um, you know, please don't visit the church this weekend if you're looking for the water slide, cause that's not true, you know? <laughs> and so I think early on, we realized that there was like a sec sub segment of the population that that's just not going to get satire. That's going to get confused. And um, and it's, you know, it's obviously funny to us. Like we don't want to, we don't want to cause harm or, or, or confuse people, but it, it is funny that there's certain people who just don't get satire. Um, but then pretty quickly, the tone of the fact checks and the aggressiveness with which they came after us changed, you know, it was, it went from like, oh, that's just a playful church joke to like, when we started doing a little bit more politics and a little bit more current events, and it became clear that we were more on the right, um, you know, the, the, the fact check started being like, oh, this is harmful misinformation. These guys are clearly um, are clearly trying to confuse people. Um, they're, they're, they used phrases like uh, Bamalami intentionally muddies the waters of current events to spread disinformation and harm. And, um, you know, which is crazy. It's the first thing from the truth. We're just a couple of guys you know, at the time, just a couple of guys you know, sitting in a garage trying to come up with jokes like that. That is the the atmosphere, you know. Um, so. And, and then pretty quickly, big tech, Facebook, Twitter, you know, they, they started having all these concerns about misinformation during the 2016 election and beyond. 
And so at that point, they like kind of started lumping us in like Babylon B is one of the purveyors of, of false information. And so like when Snopes fact checks something, Facebook then links to that fact check on our articles. And um, so then you'll read a story like one of the early ones was uh, CNN purchases industrial washing machine to spin the news. <laughs> and, it, you know, stupid joke, I know. But the you know, but then we got threatened with deplatforming and demonetization by Facebook because they said, oh, well, you, you Snopes fact checked it. So therefore it's um, therefore you're spreading harmful misinformation, which is crazy. Like why? If we were trying to fool people, why would we make up an article about a giant washing machine spinning the news? Like so stupid. Um, but it became clear early on that this whole like fact check ecosystem that they have um, was going to was going to come after us hard. Um, but we've been really, you know, we've been really blessed by um, by the amount of support that we've gotten from subscribers, from followers. Um, any, you know, anytime we get banned or we get something deleted, like, are we really get people rallying around us? And um, you know, you get people on both sides of the political aisle, and you get people who aren't even Christians out there defending us. Um, it always makes a big, it always makes a big news item, you know, when we get banned or suspended or something, because we're kind of at the forefront of that battle. Um, so, so far, at least, we've been pretty lucky or, or, or you know, God, is, God has been pretty generous uh, with us in terms of just allowing our, our brand and our platform and our jokes and stuff to continue to spread and grow despite the censorship. So, um I don't know, you know, we, we got God on our side. We're not super worried about it. Uh, but obviously there are there are a lot of concerns when it comes to the, the the power that something like big tech has over just something as simple as a joke. <laughs> you know, I, as an outsider looking in, one of the things that I live for is to see someone retweet, repost, share one of the articles from the Babylon Bee and they sincerely believe that it is true, that it, it, it's a, a tr true statement. And for me as an outsider, I'm just dying laughing because I'm like, this is so easily understood as satire, but you're so smart for your own self. You don't even recognize, you know, what you're doing, what you're sharing. And I think that's where I so love and appreciate the Babylon Bee because we're seeing major individuals that will retweet and share those articles like as if it was the real thing. And I know that creates you guys some trouble with the Snopes and all that and everything, but just as an outsider, I'm dying laughing because I, I'm, I'm, you know, again, this, this is so many people trying to take themselves way too seriously at times, you know, going back to the, the water slide is that's epic to me. Uh, you know, I just love that. And then the washing machine, I mean, I, I don't know. I think the world just takes themselves way too seriously a lot. But this has presented a lot of opportunities for you guys because, you know, now you have the not Babylon B, which is for the more real side of things. And, and I keep up with that and follow that. But it also presented you guys to write a book, the Babylon B Guide to Wokeness. Um, and it's presented this other opportunity for you guys to write this latest book, uh, the postmodern Pilgrim's Progress. Now, for those that may not be familiar, this is, I, I, I'll say this with satire, a continuation of John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress. So if you could, as an author, and I know you co-authored this with Joel Berry as well, but so that people have a little bit of understanding, what originally was the idea, the, kind of give me a synopsis of the original Pilgrim's Progress, because I want people to understand what your goal was with this, the postmodern Pilgrim's Progress. Yeah, so Pilgrim's Progress is one of my favorite books. It's one of the most widely sold books in, in English and history. Um, I think you know some some figures put it as the second most widely sold or uh, read book behind the Bible. Um, so if you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, absolutely, you know any of your listeners should should go read Pilgrim's Progress. Um, it, it's considered by many to be the first uh, English novel. Um, it was written during a stint in prison by um, by John Bunyan uh, in the late 1600s, and he. Um, he he writes it as a he writes it as a dream sequence 
Um, and it's kind of interesting. It's very, it's very novel uh, <laughs> for the first English novel. Um, it, he writes it as this dream sequence that he lies down um, in prison and then he dreams a dream. And in the dream, he sees a man and the man has a burden on his back. And it's one of the greatest, it's one of the greatest openings in all of literature. Um, you know, I was, I was paraphrasing there, but it, yeah, it's something like I, I, I lied, I lied down and I, and I, and I, I dreamed a dream and there was a man with a heavy burden on his back. So it's the story of this guy named Christian who lives in a city, the city of destruction. And he finds a book and the, and he reads this book and this book, um, this book makes him aware of this burden that he has. Um, and in the book, you know, and in the book he reads basically their city is going to be destroyed and he has to make for the celestial city to survive the destruction that's coming to their world. Um, that's just a great setup. It's just, it's fantastic. Um, and then he goes, he goes along the path towards the, uh, you know, he goes through the narrow gate and he goes along this path towards the celestial city. And then this is kind of is where you get to the second act of the book where he's, he is encountering different um, characters and situations, um, encounters that all represent things that happen in the Christian life. Um, so it's, uh, it, you know, it's stuff like he, he encounters like an atheist character. He encounters the worldly wise man who tells him like, no, don't go down the road. You know, there's a better way over here. It's much more comfortable. You know? <laughs> and he goes, and and so he's constantly like winding up in bad situations, getting in, getting in jail, going off the wrong side of the road, and um, you know, and, and and then he does meet some good characters too, who who help him along the way. Um, and there's some like ep big epic fights with the dragons, and it, it's just, it's a fantastic book. It, it, but it is an allegory, right? So it's. So the original Pilgrim's Progress is um, is very much an on the nose allegory for the Christian life. It's it's very evident, like you know, it's this is Christian. This burden represents sin. The book represents the Bible. The city of destruction represents Earth. It's you know um, humanity that's going to get destroyed. Um, and, and you know, Bunyan even breaks the fourth wall sometimes, and he just says like, "By the way, this character represents this." You know, <laughs> he just tells you like, in case you missed it, this is what this guy. This is what this guy represents, and then he has um, uh, Bible uh, scripture references throughout to to tell you what you know, it, like uh, you know, uh, Christian has the shield of faith or whatever, and he'll reference in Ephesians. You know, this is where it talks about the shield of faith. Um, so it was intended to be very didactic and instructive. You know, it was intended to be read as um, a, a way to teach people about the Christian life, which is just a great you know a great goal and a great way to do. It. But it's also just a great story. Um, and so, um, I, I I read that when I was in um, when I was like in late junior high, early high school, and it just blew me away. I, you know, I didn't really know much about it. And I, I had picked up a copy from a from a thrift store or something, and I I blew through it, and I was just like, this is incredible. And so that idea for doing a postmodern version, I think, was started sort of planted like bouncing around my head for a decade <laughs> after that. <laughs> I love this because of the aspect that you're able to incorporate on um, everything that you guys have been doing, but also given that a little bit of satire, but reality at the same time, everything that's going on now, I'm going to be just point blank, brutally honest here. I love the main character's name. I think you, you heard the word of the Lord when you titled his name. <laughs> <laughs> the main character is Ryan, which I think is just epic from my point of view. And by the way, you mentioned March 1st. That's my birthday as well. So, I, you know, I think there's so much relatable uh, in this process. But in what you guys did and, and how you're doing it, I, I am curious, though, because you have a desire that's connected to this. But you wrote this. Uh, with you know your, your your partner there in 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 the Babylon B and stuff and what you guys are doing, you didn't take this journey on by yourself. Why did you feel like I need to bring Joel along for this? Yeah, yeah, that kind of came about because you know this idea. I, I thought about it actually. I just remember when I was when I was like in junior high, I made a um, a Pilgrim's Progress board game, and uh, <laughs> I. 
I had it all like I had, you know, I had all these combat rules and this and that, you know, that 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 uh, you would go through and fight all this. It was terrible, I'm sure. But, um, you know, so this idea of like of, of I need to get this thing out there for people to read today was bouncing around. Um, but it was like 2017. And I remember I was dry, I was I was helping to co-pastor a church in San Diego and I I was driving through. um, um I was driving through Mission Trails uh, Regional Park there, and it's just beautiful, you know, the hills, and you can see these paths going through, and it's a beautiful day, and and I started thinking about Pilgrim's Progress and the and the you know a, a Christian's journey, and uh, and I and and it just hit, and I had been writing for the Babylon Bee for about a year and a year and a half, and we had just started writing our book, How to Be a Perfect Christian, and I and I started thinking like, man, you know, we could do so much with the Babylon Bee. Um, you know, with the platform that we have. And I started thinking about Pilgrim's Progress and that, so that idea of like bringing it back started, started coming to the surface. So I immediately went home and wrote like 10,000 words of this novel, you know, like, oh man, this can be great. You have this char character named Ryan and he's going to, you know, but it was completely, di it was actually totally different than the version that, that, uh, that is getting published now. Um, Cause the idea kind of went into, went um, at, at the time I was working a sales job, I was, I was co-pastoring a church. Um, I had, uh, I, I was doing you know, part-time writing for the Babylon Bee, about four articles a day for the Babylon Bee. So it all kind of just went into a drawer and I was like, man, well, I'll finish this sometime. And um, Joel Berry came on as our managing editor a couple of years ago. And we had just pit, well, we, we had started talking about pitching some book ideas around and, um, and I, I thought about the old Pilgrim's Progress thing. So I, I went back to it and started dusting it off. And I thought, it, you know, I, I liked what I wrote and, but it was, it was so serious, you know, like I, I was reading this and I'm just like, um, you know, people have already read Pilgrim's Progress. I, I don't need to rewrite it. Like <laughs> if you're going to write, if you're going to read a serious allegory of the Christian, of the Christian life and this journey and, and it's going to be, did, did, you know, uh, didactic and instructive. It's like, just read Bunyan's book. That's a great thing to do. Um, I don't need to, to, you know, reinvent the wheel there. Um, and so I showed it to my writing partner, Joel. And um, he was like, you know, he was like, oh, this is great. He actually, he actually liked the version I wrote and wanted to keep it. And I was like, no, I just, I don't, you know, I don't know, throw some ideas my way. And so he ended up writing the whole introduction from the perspective of the narrator. Um, and he came up with this idea for this angelic character who's kind of peering down at the mystery that is Ryan's life. And he's, he's bemused by humans. He's, he, he's funny, you know, he's like, he's watching what humans do and he doesn't understand it. Um, and his whole mission is to like record stories that happen in God's creation and record stories of redemption. And, but he doesn't understand why God loves humans or he doesn't understand why God does these things. Um, and so, so he's constantly commenting on, you know, fashion choices and movies and different things that <laughs> that uh, that humans do or humans enjoy and he doesn't understand and it doesn't understand why so i loved the idea of like okay now we can take this kind of hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy style voice and and that allows us to break the fourth wall a lot it allows us to uh, it, it's a great vehicle for us to inject a lot of like babylon b style humor into the book so it's not just going to be this this dreary, serious trudge along this path the whole time. But we can still get to those serious moments. We can still get to those dramatic moments. We can still hopefully teach people, but we can do it in a way that's kind of sugar-coated with humor um, and wit and and, and 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 irony. And that's much more in our writing style. Like that's much more something that Babylon B fans um, will be used to, you know, that we're telling that, that we're just goofing around, joking around. There's all these references, and then bam, all of a sudden there's this there's this uh, important theological point that's made. Um, <laughs> so, so that was how, it, that was how Joel got involved. And then he and I fleshed out the first three or four chapters. We pitched it around to some publishers. It ended up landing at Salem books along with our guide to wokeness. And, um, and yeah, we've just been very excited. So from then on, it was very, the process was like, I'm going to write what I'm excited about. You write what you're excited about. And then we'll, well, sessions together, like stitching things and fixing things. And I, I think the biggest challenge was like, you know, consistency sake. It's like, oh, this happens here. And then yeah, we we had a big fight over the sword. There's a sword that the character gets. And like, I, I'm constantly referencing the sword later in the book. And Joel's like, 
oh, I broke the sword back in chapter nine or, you know, whatever. And I'm like, no, we need the sword here. And so we were, we were constantly trying to figure out what to do with the sword. That was like a, it's like a big argument that we have throughout the book. But so, uh, but it was really fun to write with a partner. It made it, it made it fun. It made, you know, it, it made it challenging. It made it, it gave us motivation to, you know, we got to get this thing out the door and, um, you know, otherwise I would have just sat on my computer and stared at a screen probably and this book never would have seen the light of day. <laughs> I like hearing that story because ultimately you're able to complement one another with kind of your different points of views. And I love that. I'm just thankful Joel didn't recommend changing the main character's name. That's all I'm thankful <laughs> of. You know, you can argue over the sword, but as long as it's still Ryan, you know, I got to fight for the name. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, when we read uh, Bunyan's original Pilgrim's Progress and we get the storyline of Christian or we hear the storyline of Christian, there's a lot of people going to say, you know what, even without reading that, I hear that, that intrigues me, that draws me in. I feel like I can relate to that. How are you presenting to people, even in the midst of the DNA of the Babylon Bee and what you guys do in this postmodern Pilgrim's Progress, how are you presenting to people the importance of that character being relatable to people in this day and time? Yeah, so the, the title, The Postmodern Pilgrim's Progress, is, represents the main character's worldview. Um, he he kind of grows up in a in a Christianish family. Um, you know, his his little brother is a Christian, and maybe his parents are kind of, you know, uh, uh, Christmas and Easter only Christians, or they're okay with uh, they're okay with the the brother being a Christian, but they're not they're not super hardcore. Um, and he and he grow and then his it, right, right in the first no spoilers, you know, like right in the first chapter, you find out that Ryan's little brother has died. Um, has passed away and he's struggling, you know, he's, he, he, he's probably not an out and out atheist because he doesn't even, he doesn't even think that truth matters. You know, it's, there, there's no purpose to this world. It's all meaningless. And this is very much the spirit of our age today. Um, if there, our book has this kind of multiverse uh, uh, framework that's kind of built in, it's not, super overemphasized, but, you know, there's this idea that as Ryan dreams this allegory sequence that he's like actually warping to this other reality. And there's all these, there's all these universes that are colliding and they're all for God's glory uh, in the end. Um, but that's very much the opposite of what, you know, multiverse stuff is very popular nowadays, but it's all, it's all like, well, there's a multiverse, but nothing matters. And, um, you know, it, we just have to find our own meaning and create our own meaning. And it's such a, such a destructive philosophy. Um, but yeah, our hope is that people will see that, like the questions that Ryan asks, like, why did my brother die? Um, you know, why is there evil in the world? Does anything matter? Um, you know, he's trudging along this road and he's, you know, he's kind of learning and he's doing acts of heroism, but nobody sees it and it doesn't matter. And it's like, did, did, did this, did any of this matter? You know, that's the question that our generation is asking. Everything you see out there is just nihilism. And, and, uh, you know, be a good person, but there's not really a purpose for it. I just watched um, that that new multiverse movie, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. And um, it it's like, it's, it's so close because, I, I, I don't know, spoiler alert, I guess, but it's so close to truth because it's like, you know, the whole point of it is like that there's this multiverse and you can, there's infinite number of realities and there's there's a reality for everything and, um, and then the main character's, uh, the main character's daughter, if I got that right, is, you know, it basically encounters the idea that everything, nothing matters. And so she has this, like, they have it as a bagel, but it's like, there's this void that's sucking everything in and, and you just need to stare at the void and realize that nothing matters, you know? And I'm like, this is like a powerful indictment of nihilism. I'm like, wow, you know? But in the end of the story, they basically come to the conclusion, yeah, that's true. Nothing does matter. And then they go, well, but but we just need to love each other because nothing matters, you know? <laughs> and I'm just like, what? <laughs> you know, at the end, you just feel so empty at the end of the movie. Like, <laughs> what? Like, there is, oh, okay, there isn't meaning. You know, the villain was right. Like, there's no meaning. That's true. 
And they're just like, but we're going to defy the meaninglessness by loving each other. And you're just like, but that doesn't matter. You just said it didn't matter, you know? <laughs> like, so, so I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm going on a tangent, but I, I, I just, you know, it's similar with the old hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, you know, just create your own meaning. Um, uh, so we wanted to take that a uh, concept like, you know, that you can go through, you can go through hell and you can see like good people die for no reason at all and then realize, but it's all in the end, it's part of the plan and the purpose of the king. You know, that's kind of the, that's kind of the way that we wanted people to be able to re relate to Ryan was, was to, I mean, sorry, if I'm going too long, you can interrupt me, but uh, Christian, Christian art often doesn't have the characters ask like legitimate questions. Like they, we don't, we don't want those legitimate doubts and questions to be asked yeah. or, or we want, or we want them to be answered with a very neat bow on them. You know, you know, you, you want the, you want the Christian character to debate the atheist professor and beat him. And then the atheist dies because he gets hit by a, a bus or whatever. And then they go to the newsboys, newsboys concert and everybody's happy, you know, and it's like, we, we wanted to <laughs> not to be too specific, but we wanted, um, so we wanted like Ryan, we wanted the reader to, when Ryan is doubting that anything it is, it, that anything has meaning, we wanted the reader to sympathize with his question and go, well, that's a legit question. Like, you know, we really wanted to hammer that home. Like you should almost be depressed at points where you're like, yeah. gosh, this is pretty, pretty nihilistic. But then that allows us to kind of pull the rug out and say at the end, like there is this meaning. So hopefully that kind of answered your question. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing as you're, kind of walking through this and you're talking this out, one of the things that kind of comes to my mind, um, I've, you know, I'm not a prolific writer by any stretch of the imagination. I've published and and had published a total of three books so far, but they're not nonfiction. They're, you know, um, very much some real stories and real aspects and, of course, scripture grounded. I've written, I don't know how many blogs and stuff, but none of it is nonfiction. And as you're describing this and asking those challenging questions, one of the things that's coming through my mind, and, and I, I would like to know this, is when you're asking those questions, the things that people don't want to talk about, one thing that came to my mind, Kyle, is it's kind of like when it comes to the topic of suicide, people want a simple yes or no. That's all they're, they, they, they don't want to walk things out and listen to that. They're looking for just that definitive when it comes to some hard things or they completely ignore it. And that like, you know, if I don't ever acknowledge it, it'll never be there. But when you're writing this nonfiction story out and you're having to put the main character through these aspects of life and the difficulties of things, did you find yourself as an individual, you know, growing or being challenged or, you know, figuring things out for yourself as you're you're giving this um, allegory of a, of a character but there's some realness, even in nonfiction things that we write, there's definitely pieces of us. But then I know that you had to put yourself in positions that you may have not experienced yet. So did that change you in writing that? Yeah, I think like like I was saying, when you have when you have Ryan question the existence of God um, or you have, you know, you have these dark night of the soul moments for the main character where, where he's just aimless and just says, I have reached, I have reached the absolute bottom and I've reached rock bottom. And then we drop the rock bottom out even more. And it's like, you're putting him through the ringer and then you have, but, but then as an author, you have to bring him back through, you know, you have to have that moment of redemption and you can't have that be empty. You know, you can't have that be, uh, you have to earn that, you know, so you can, you can't have that just be like, Oh, well, you know, uh, wave your hand and a miracle happened. And then, you know, whatever you, you have to earn those moments. Um, it, it's, Tolkien called them uh, you catastrophes with the, the concept that you can have a catastrophe. That's good. You know, the, these moments of like, but then against all odds, you know, our hero emerges victorious. Um, but you have to earn them through the main character's growth. And so when like, there's a moment, um, there's a moment in the book where they're arguing with um, an atheist character. And we wrote the atheist a little funny, like he's wearing a fedora, your stereotypical atheist attire. Um, and he's he's arguing with people via a bird message, you know, as kind of our, our reference to Twitter. But 
if he's he's writing little notes on and he's arguing with people about the existence of the king you know he's like oh the king doesn't you know and so we have some funny moments where he's like the king doesn't exist and i and i hate him and i spend all my waking moments thinking about him you know so that's kind of that was kind of our little our little dig on atheism or whatever but but at the end of that en encounter you have the atheist go you have you have ryan and and faith his companion at the time you have them walking down the path and they kind of feel bad for him and they walk away and you have them kind of say well what if, you know well what if he's right you know <laughs> and uh and there's this moment of like oh man like how do we get those characters to find satisfying answers for those questions because we as as christians don't even have all those satisfying answers you know it's like there's tons of great apologetics for the christian faith obviously the word of god uh, builds faith in us and and, and we believe um and, and and we try to cast out doubts you know and and but you, there's still that moment of faith. There's still that moment where you have to step out and say, okay, I, I, I'm never going to be 100%. I'm never going to have, I, I'm never going to find that conclusive 100% argument, but I believe anyway, I'm going to step out in faith. So we have to find that moment. And I think that for me was one of the things that was like, you know, it was one of those things that made me say like, I have to research and find that argument and find that moment of faith for myself as well. Um, I also think just the the main message of the book really is is just to keep moving forward, take one step at a time, put one foot in front of the other. It's a very simple message, but it's one that the church needs to hear because we're we're in a time where people want like the big explosive mega church growth or like you want the big viral like you know, I want to be a celebrity pastor or massive author or whatever. And um and it uh, more often it's one step one step, one step. And it's just that uh, we have the Nietzsche quote in the book where he calls it a long obedience in the same direction. Um, and that's kind of, that's, that is very much what the Christian life is like. It's a, it's an endurance race, not a, uh, not a big, not big leaps and bounds. So for me, that's the struggle because we had such overnight success with the Babylon Bee that in my daily life, I can go, oh man, you know, none of the jokes are hitting today or like, you know, there's been a few weeks, we haven't had any big viral moments, you know, and, and so it's tempting for me to go like, ah, uh, you know, well, it's all over or uh, imposter syndrome. I, I, I've never been funny or, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. That's It's tempting, you know, to feel that way. But I have to, the lesson that I kind of take from the book, because I'm just preaching to myself really is like, it is that ordinary everyday faithfulness that God is after and not the big, you know, radical moments of sacrifice. Like, while those are great, more typically 99% of the Christian life is going to be just trying to be faithful in ordinary things. Yeah. Well, Kyle, one of the things I try to give each of my guests the opportunity to do is have that final thought, that last word. Maybe there was something that you wanted to share that I didn't get to ask. I didn't get to present in a way. It's something that's on your heart. Maybe we covered everything and there's absolutely nothing you want to share, but I do want to give you that opportunity to maybe have that last word, that final thought. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I don't know when this publishes, but the, the book comes out June 7th. So maybe it's up by now. Um, it, oh, hold on. Let me grab it. I got it right here. So um, we're, we're, we're really excited about this. Wait, I got to let the light adjust. There you go. Um, we're really excited about this thing. It's so cool to hold in my hand. Um, we, we, got a, we got an amazing, amazingly talented map artist named Jamie Foley, and she did this really cool um, fantasy map of our, of our little fantasy world. That's always been a dream of mine, you know, write a fantasy book and get a fantasy map uh, <laughs> and get a fantasy map done. We also had a really talented illustrator that did the little little uh, deals in, in the uh, by the epigraphs on each chapter and those are wonderful um, yeah you know I, I think I don't know that we talked much about just the general structure of the book is that we have these we have all these encounters with uh, modern characters that you meet in the church and that's kind of the the elevator pitch is that you're gonna meet as you read this book, you know, he's going to, uh, Brian's going to encounter people and you're going to go, oh, I know who they're talking about. <laughs> or like, or like I've, I've encountered that person at church. Um, that's the kind of thing that's, that was a lot of fun. Uh, was a lot of fun to do. One of my favorite encounters in the book is they encounter Chesterton's fence. And if you don't know what Chesterton's fence is, it's a illustration that um, GK Chesterton made a uh, hundred years ago, where he talked about if you, 
come across a fence in the middle of the of a field, don't tear it down until you know why it's there. Um, and so we have a lot of fun with that, that there's some protesters that want to tear the oppressive fence down, and but they don't know why. And, and then there's a fun, exciting conclusion <laughs> to that. So we have a lot of those fun like things that you'll recognize and we have a lot of humor, but but it's something that we hope in the end people are uh, people will be moved by and, uh, and, and encouraged in their Christian walk. Well, I love it. Again, the book is The Postmodern Pilgrim's Progress by Kyle Mann and Joel Berry. Kyle, where can people find it when it is available? You can find it, uh, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on uh, Barnes & Noble, Christian Books. Uh, what is it? Is it called ChristianBooks.com? One of those. Yes. Um, anywhere books are sold. I think we're also going to be selling it on our Babylon Bee store at shop.babylonbee.com. I don't think it's quite listed yet, but we're, we're going to get it listed there if you want to buy directly from us as well. So, uh, yeah, you can get basically anywhere books are sold. And I would strongly encourage everyone to get a copy of this book. Also, if you've never had the opportunity to read John Bunyan's uh, book on the Pilgrim's Progress, maybe you want to go down that road first as well to kind of get a little bit more familiarity. Make sure to follow and connect with the Babylon Bee. If you never have, the website is up now. Um, and of course, Kyle and them, uh, they're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, even Kyle himself has a Twitter account and such and everything. So I don't think I'm leaving everything out. If there's something else, how to get in touch with you guys. No, it's all good. And yeah, I'm happy to just be here to plug John Bunyan's book. If you go by John Bunyan's and not mine, I'm a hundred percent okay with that. Cause, uh, cause his is much better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're mapping this stuff out in high school, it obviously had an effect on you proficiently, you know, because you and I were on two different paths in high school. I was on a destructive <laughs> path. So that's pretty amazing in and of itself. Kyle, again, thank you so much uh, for making a, a bucket list for me to be able to have you on. I sincerely appreciate it and everything that you guys are doing. I'm looking forward to this book greatly. Thank you so much. And for everyone else, we genuinely hope and pray that this episode has encouraged you, it has equipped you, and it has challenged you to further advance the kingdom of God. Until the next episode, guys, we love you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.